Hey everyone, and welcome to another week of OSHIP. This week I've got my friend Sergio Mello joining us. Uh, Sergio is a great entrepreneur. I met him uh, many years ago through our kind of common passion around aviation at an event for EasyJet of all places in London. Uh, we met randomly networking at the event and, and frankly had a, a big fun night together and ended up becoming uh, you know, first friends. So connected over our love of technology, or shared passion of, of being entrepreneurs. And frankly, he's just generally a fun guy. One of the other things that we share uh, a common background around is the fact that we both lived and worked all over the world. Uh, I have, uh, you know, I'm originally English, but I moved to England when I was, when I was young, but I've wor- lived and worked in Miami, uh, New York. Uh, I've lived in London, uh, lived and worked in London, Amsterdam. Uh, I've done a stint in Shanghai. Um, Sergio is, is an Italian who has lived in uh, lived and worked in Torino, Italy. Uh, I think he's done a stint in Seoul in Korea. He's done Cape Town in South Africa, uh, Hong Kong. Um, so a really big mix of places between the two of us. And so uh, today uh, we're going to talk about this concept we're calling a kind of stranger in a strange land. And it's going to be all about the tales of living and working abroad. Um, why should you care about Sergio's opinion beyond the fact that he's a well-traveled guy? He has been the founder of a very innovative travel startup called Satisfly. Uh, he was the CEO of the blockchain company Tangem. Um, he's even done a stint at Reddit uh, and uh, is the innovation, head of innovation at a company called Travel Star. But I think when you get to know more about him in a second and see about some of his, his adventures and his experience, um, you're really going to enjoy today's show. And with that, here we go with another week of OSHIP. OSHIP. Sergio, welcome to OSHIP. Glad you're here. Thanks, Freddie. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's uh, it, funny enough, Sergio uh, normally lives, uh, lives in uh, San Francisco. We actually had a chance to see each other in, in person last night, one of my first kind of meetups in, in Miami in, uh, or South Florida in quite a while. Uh, and I think it's ironic that you know, here we are back on, on video a, a day later. Uh, but uh, you know, something, something about the, the OSHA ship format works, even if, it, even if it's virtual. Um, but it's great to have you down in South Florida regardless, Sergio. So, um, you know, again, I, I tried to give a little bit of your, your background uh, and the intro for the show, but, and I know you uh, very well, but I think it would be very helpful if you introduced yourself to our audience and gave us kind of a, kind of a brief overview um, of, you know, a little bit of, of your background. That is one of the most challenging things to do. <laughs> <laughs> is in fact, as you said, it's so diverse that it, yeah. always, uh, it is always a bit off-putting to just hear the diversity of things. I always describe myself as a generalist, mostly because uh, of all the trades I can uh, handle. And that is part by education, part by experience, part by genes. Like my dad also was an was a, uh, all-encompassing entrepreneur who adapted in technology, but traveled and built various things throughout his life, um, lives, literally. <laughs> So it all started in Italy, of course, I'm Italian, you may hear it from my accent, I, but I was traveling a lot with my family and that already did put a seed in my mind in the understanding that there was something beyond the walls uh, of the Alpine mountains in Italy. And uh, so I did study uh, foreign languages since I was a kid, French and English mostly. Uh, I started following my father's footsteps. I started doing my own businesses. I dropped out of university. It was an um, engineering, electronic engineering degree, and I was very passionate about it, but I also started building a company at the same time, and I realized that it was so much more exciting. And uh, I also saw myself uh, doing more of that in the rest of my life rather than uh, um, going um, deep in tech, uh, specifically in um, electronics. And so I decided to just jump the boat and uh, run my own business. It was going okay, but at the same time, I realized that Torino and Milano was not enough of a total addressable market to make it really a huge business. 
and um, and so why to limit myself uh, to one geographic uh, micro region? So I started looking around. I realized that China; those were the uh, 2000, just after the dot yeah. com bubble, and uh, China was uh, really booming. Um, and what, it was, was your, also was way your first more. In, in China, was it straight to Hong Kong? No, I first went to near Shanghai, a place called yeah. Ningbo. It's um, it's one of those big industrial cities in the Zhejiang mm -hmm. province, and um, a lot was going on at the time. It was really being um, built by the day. You know, when you look at those skyscrapers and you see a few extra floors every day, and um, uh, a lot of the manufacturing industry was uh, um, active there. Uh, you'd have uh, power shutdowns at night just to provide enough electricity to the factories to, um, to produce. Those were the days. And so I was very curious. I was very interested. I was. Uh, I realized that something was going on there. And for the next decade, um, China would be leading in, uh, in growth. And uh, then I said, I have to be here. So I slowly tapered down the business in Italy. I spent a few months here and there. I got some consulting gigs uh, with Italian clients who had uh, their uh, branches or businesses in, in that region of China to help them out with IT and basic stuff, just just to, as a like uh, as a pad to to, yeah. to grow from and an observation point. Yeah. And um, I started realizing a lot of things about East Asia, to which I was uh, not privy first. And I decided to move, so I went then one year in Korea. Luckily, the European Commission sponsors. Uh, few cherry pick managers every year to go to Korea with a program called executive training program, which I highly recommend that uh, sends people to Korea and Japan uh, to learn the trade, learn the language, uh, learn the culture and uh, continue onwards with their business enterprises, corporate or uh, startups um, there. Uh, one year in Korea was extremely interesting. I learned the language. Uh, I went to Yonsei University and the Institute of Management and um, I did look into starting businesses there as well, but um, I needed more of a broad um, platform. Yeah. And at the time, this was at this point, 2007-ish, uh, Hong Kong was much better of a platform to have um, a startup business and to travel abroad from there. Uh, better connected, better, um, legal framework based on common law in English. So it was clearly a lot more friendly. Um, also, culturally speaking, doing business in Korea was, and, and here we're getting to the, the core of our conversation, right? Doing business in Korea is, uh, at least was 10 years ago, not uh, too easy for a foreigner. A lot of restrictions, a lot of um, uh, hoops to jump through. Um, it would be actually expensive also to, to set all of those uh, uh, requirements up. Um, and unless, it, uh, and also the startup scene is something that um, in our world has always yeah. been there, especially in the US, startups had, have been aiding uh, probably since before I was born. But uh, um, in Italy, they started later being recognized as a, as a good thing or, a, or something to be proud about or something yeah. to be helped and, and fostered by, by a bigger industry. Um, in Eastern Asia, uh, 2007, there was no such thing. Yeah. Um, so I decided to go to Hong Kong, which didn't really have a startup scene, but at least had the right uh, um, environment and uh, yeah. substrate to uh, fertile soil, right, to plant your seeds. Yeah. So that was 2008. And from then on, uh, compound 13, 14 years in Asia, um, uh, spent mostly in Hong Kong and Taiwan. My wife is Taiwanese, and so her job brought her back to Taiwan. It was a great experience to spend a few years there. So, so, so I, I want to take a stop off on some of these before mm -hmm. we go, kind of go, go go through all of them. So, you know, you get your Italian guy, you, I don't know, were you, were you kind of, were you were pretty well-traveled when you were younger, or was this like a pretty big jump to, to go someplace like this? Um, both. I mean, I was definitely well traveled. My parents were so good in, in taking me places. In fact, we had a half plan with the family to move to California when I was about seven years old. I still remember that plan fell through, but we had come over yeah. here to the US so many times. And so I was accustomed to seeing other places and speaking other languages. Uh, 
but packing my stuff and we just going uh, out on a one way flight was uh, was rather unique at the time. I also say I don't think people understand this part of it. Like living in Asia, um, when you when you live in different parts of Europe, if you move from America to to any kind of Western civilization, it's still based in some kind of fundamentally um, similar culture. They originated all from one kind of a place. For me, anyway, when I, you know, when I moved to Shanghai, it was a little, it felt like a little bit like moving on to Mars. Sometimes it was like, you know, the culture is fundamentally uh, and foundationally built on something completely different, and it, 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 you know, you could just just watching people eat in a restaurant was interesting because things were just fundamentally different. I I love that uh, personally because I like being thrown in the deep end, but you're you're definitely a fish out of water. Um, and yeah, so I'd love to kind of understand, um, you know, you're, you're, you're in this culture, let's say the very first time, so let, you know, it's one thing to think about you, you know, being a, 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 an international business person working in, in, um, at further down in your career, if you've done this now multiple times, but the very, very first time you did this, you know, what was, what was that like for you per personally? I mean, how, how did that, you know, what was your experience like, and, uh, uh, you know, both personally and professionally? There's, um, it's it's never really black and white. So the first time I really I went to China, I I was in a time of my life I decided I want drastic change for many reasons, including being a bit of a rebel, and um, going out all the way there with a one-way ticket and um, not much budget and um, just a laptop and my skills was. Uh, was a good uh, was a good primer. Mm -hmm. Then I don't know if it's coincidental, but one day I got struck by lightning. <laughs> this is not a joke. Literally struck by <laughs> I lightning. Never told you this story. Yeah, I was I'm on sure. top of a mountain. Yeah. I was on top of a mountain, and uh, and my good friend yes, Luca and Federico and, uh, and Filippo were were holding the, the rope on the other end. And uh, anyway, it's for another a chapter probably, but. Um, all was good, clearly, uh, but um, it made me think a little bit, and I decided to to change a few things in my life, rather than stay and um, be subject to no change. Yeah. And this proved to be the right choice to do. And I realized it when I came back after spending the first few years abroad, uh, especially after Korea, it went back to my hometown. And I had um, dinner with my friends I used to hang out with years earlier. And we went to the same restaurant, had the same food, had the same conversations with the same people. And everything was the same. I almost felt like life stopped there and didn't progress. And without uh, exposure to new elements, without exposure to new information, no one can really grow fast. Mm. It's the, a personal growth has to be proportional to the amount of information, new information mm. you drink from the fire hose. Mm. So mm. you shouldn't always be drinking from a fire hose, but fire mm. are—they're uh, good. That they really provide new, new, new fresh wind, and uh, and uh, it's a source of um, life and motivation. So I started doing a lot of things. For endurance uh, sports I started uh, um, cutting a lot of ties with uh, with Italian acquaintances which I uh, it, it's not about Italy here it's just about you know your your nest and, and jumping out of the nest like little um, little birds when they're uh, ready to go they're just thrown out and either they fly or, or they don't and in some way they're gonna have to find their way and so I decided to do that uh, that thing and, and so, so, so this, you know, you've got your your kind of stage one, let's call it forward experience. You're you're out there. You're a solo entrepreneur at this point, mm -hmm. um, and I think you're you're trying to wrap your head around this the, the first time. Doesn't sound like you had a big support network, or or did you? Like, I mean, who? Yeah, like, exactly. So that's where I was saying it, it, it's not really black or white. Yeah. You could go with zero support network. It's just going to take you a little more time to, to figure out things. Um, I always had a bit of a first contact situation 
where I could start from somewhere. Uh, either someone that had worked there before, introduced me to someone, someone else. This was this was pre-social media, so you couldn't just go on LinkedIn or a small world or uh, Facebook and, and pick up 20, 30 people to, uh, to meet and, um, and start having a social circle. Um, so you'd start with uh, some email introductions or someone from a chamber of commerce or, or some similar um, um, setups. And um, I always managed to have at least something before. Yeah, I never really went in a complete um, blank page situation. Mm -hmm. I I don't think it's it's uh, smart. Once you make a decision, once you are committed to enter a new environment, then you can start preparing um, you know, ahead of time. It's not cheating. <laughs> you're still going to a new environment. I mean, you know you're going to jump out of the nest. You may as well start flapping your wings to try a little bit. What's wrong with that? You're still jumping on a nest, but why to why to go unprepared? So some of the some of the things when you when you get there and you have this kind of fish out of water syndrome. I, I'm going to give an example for me, and I, I and I don't know if that inspires anything for you. There are the of there are the things that are cultural challenges that maybe aren't so obvious um, that you have to wrap your head around, which I'll kind of reference in a second. Some of these things, though. Or are quite literally physical things. And what I mean by that is, look, I'm a six foot three, 200 pound plus guy. And mm -hmm. I, I, I have these visions of, I remember me standing in the, in the lift going up, you know, the 50 odd floors or whatever it was in, in the Shanghai office of Sapien. And I'd be, uh, you know, in, in basically in the lift. And I just felt like, I felt like a, like a superhero when I was there because I felt like I was so much bigger than everyone. I it definitely gave me delusions of grandeur that I was like, you know, Thor or something, you know, it's like, I'm like, look at this giant, giant person. And then, uh, you know, so you felt, you felt like you, you kind of, I just kind of stood out by virtue of that alone. Um, you know, let alone the fact that, you know, now you're, you're, you're just not understanding some of the really basic cultural stuff. Um, for me, I'd say one of those things that um, really uh, impacted me or, or it was it was a big change is, um, you know, I'm, I'm the type of leader uh, that I like to um, be very close with the, the staff and I and I intermingle with people and I go and talk to people at every level of the business. And I was one of the, you know, the senior leaders in the in the in the Shanghai office of Sapien. And I didn't understand how hierarchical um, the business was there and how for some of the more junior people, this was a bit of a freak out for them, basically, that, you know, that, that I didn't care about maybe some of these traditional lines. Now, that may have been just the, I'm not, I don't want to stereotype and apply that to an entire culture, but it certainly seemed like um, it applied to a, a lot of people. Did you find that you, you know, were you experiencing any kind of unique cultural challenges like that? Um, that that you know impacted the way that you either did business with other people or even acted as a leader yourself. Every single day, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. yeah, from the first to the last, yeah, and still, and still today, even after so much uh, experience, you, you always find the new little uh, idiosyncrasies in every little microculture. Um, my favorites are shaking hands. How how do you? Um, how do you introduce yourself? How do you make that first um, icebreaker move? Yeah. It's so different from country to country. And we're not even talking west versus east here. It's north, south. But it, it's really, there's at least 20 or 30 ways to do it across the world. You're in, uh, in East Asia, usually you bow. And actually, after living one year in Korea, I went back to Italy for a few months. I was bowing to people and asked me if I was OK. Are you, are you in pain? That's what they asked me. Um, whereas in the US, a solid, well, pre COVID, clearly a solid shake on hand is, uh, or even in Europe, is, uh, is considered a really um, uh, necessary move to, to, to exude confidence and to, um, to introduce yourself. Um, in other places, you should uh, also hug and like give kisses. Um, in other places, you should hold hands for a while. And in certain African countries, you literally walk around holding hands with your business partner as, as a show of uh, uh, trust and, um, and um, proximity. It's, uh, it can be really different. 
I can try and imagine you and I like, walking, boys, so yeah, yeah. walking into a meeting in New York holding hands and uh, might, it might confuse some people. So yeah, that, that's definitely mm -hmm. another one that really got me uh, that is uh, maybe a little bit inappropriate, but still entertaining. You know, I think part of uh, the, the, the culture, at least in Shanghai, was that, you know, they, they, they like to wine and dine, you know, what they perceive as kind of senior po folks and take them out to, uh, you know, special places. And I, 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 you know, like I said, I'm a pretty big guy. I'm half English, so I got uh, a half a decent alcohol tolerance. And I would literally watch these, these, these poor guys you know, drink themselves cross-eyed trying to trying to make me have a good time uh and it really it really uh ended up far worse for them than it ever ended up for me it was just it almost 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 felt bad made for some fun nights but yeah i, I watched some people get themselves in pretty awkward situations trying to trying and to entertain me it's very important to understand what they do there right so uh, it is yeah of course uh, all throughout not only east asia but mostly in east asia that's uh, the common factor that uh a business dinner ends up with a lot of um, alcohol. Maybe things have changed recently. I actually haven't been there in the last few years. Uh, of course, COVID <laughs> changed it. But um, one fundamental important reason is that the way feedback is communicated in cultures where there's a lot of respect for uh, uh, not losing face is very different than Western culture. In the US, the more direct, the better. I could tell you, Freddie, and I'll give you the shit sandwich. Everything's fine. We like you very much. There's a few things we can improve, but good. And that's the shit sandwich structure. You cannot do this in East Asia. You have to go out for dinner. And when everyone's, um, sorry, I'm going to have to use the word again, shit faced, you uh, are finally able to remove the um, censorship layer. And no one's going to lose face. Because partly no one's going to remember the next day, but partly that's that's where uh, you have uh, uh, um, free port and <laughs> tax-free zone, right? And uh, you can um, give real feedback, upwards, downwards, um, customer to to supplier, either always. That that's the only place it can happen. So it's actually very important for any business dynamic within an office or with external partners to reach that level where everyone's. Uh, <laughs> and so it's a necessity. It's it's not just a habit. By the way, a quick shout out to Ann Bowman from Team O3, uh, giving being very very engaged in Chad and bringing some friends in and uh, uh, and and appreciate that. We love that you're in the audience and we're glad you love the show, Ann. So thank you so much for for participating in this week's O Ship. Um, so you know, Sergio, go, going back to where we were, if you had to think about. Uh, and I'll give an example first for me, like, it, was there anything that happened to you while you were working, you know, in any of these international um, locations that changed you fundamentally as a person? And, and while you think on that for a second, I'll give you my, my example would be, um, again, I'm going to use Shanghai again. Shanghai had the most profound impact on me personally uh, because I feel like Shanghai was so different, right? Again, Amsterdam was super mm -hmm. interesting, and we'll talk on that one in a second. Uh, London again was a bit like going home, uh, but uh, but for for Shanghai, um, the thing that I took away from that was perspective. So one of the things that I I like to do is I'm I'm a bit of an online news junkie, and I love to read news. And if I'm feeling super masochistic, I like to read the comments section of the news section. Why I like mm -hmm. to do that is, is beyond me. Uh, but I, I enjoy that. And I found that I was even doing that when I was in Shanghai and I kind of lived in, and died by using translation apps all the time. And what was so interesting to me, you know, not only in the way I was consuming media, but also social media, and even obviously in the conversations I was having with other people, was how people could look, whether, uh, you know, maybe whether it was world issues, global issues, or, or um, you know, even simple things about celebrities or pop culture or whatever, um, so differently uh, there. And and I realized, it, you know, it, it, you could have very different points of view on the exact same thing because of the way that you perceived it versus, you know, someone in that culture may perceived it. And 
you know, maybe that's the thing if you meet someone when you're traveling and everyone should go on holiday and travel and interact with people from other cultures, but maybe this wouldn't imprint on them so hard. But when I was the odd one out and I was living in their culture and I was absorbing it in and out every day for a year, um, I found that it made me really step back. And now I, now I look at every, everything all the time, even back home living in, in the States. Um, you know, I look at everything and I always find myself kind of pondering like, well, how are the people looking at this? What are the other point of views? What's the, uh, what are the other potential perspectives, even if I don't agree with them? And it, and it changed me. It really, it changed me um, as, a, as a human being. It changed me as a, as a leader. Um, it, I think it made me far more empathetic, um, but it also, you know, uh, it's, it maybe it made me a better negotiator. You know, I didn't always, you don't have to agree with someone to understand their perspective and understanding how radical, uh, radically different people's perspectives can be, I think is, is a really important thing to understand, especially when you go into a, another culture and you have to be able to approach it without judgment. Uh, you know, because the way the the ways that people look at things are could be impacted by quite literally generations of a society. Uh, you know that, that that are that are and like I said earlier, we're trying to fundamentally grounded in a in a completely different originating culture. Um, and I'm thankful for that experience. In all honesty, well, I wish more people that take big decisions in this world uh, understood that because clearly, when it comes to international politics and other big issues. Uh, Understanding where the other party is uh, coming from and how they think is everything, uh, and it's the only way to resolve a conflict or, or carry forward um, a negotiation. The um, the one time I realized how important it is um, is after many years of doing this um, exploration and, and personal growth. I was in Taiwan at the time. It was year two thousand and fourteen, fifteen, and I was leading uh, an office of. Taiwanese developers uh, for a uh, South African company. So, of course, my commute was a little long at the time, but um, I still liked it. <laughs> and um, I, at some point, I had to uh, hand off some duties. And that's when I realized how I was so used to switch the way I was behaving and, and, um, and relating to people in South Africa versus in Taiwan, and I could not bring all of them in the same meeting because I had two different ways to talk to them, two different strategies, approaches, uh, wording, speed of, of um, speech, everything was different. Mm -hmm. And so I had to rethink the way I could interface them at that point because I had always been the, the, the proxy. So I had always, no one had ever talk, had to talk within, uh, from, from South Africa to Taiwan and vice versa. I was always in between. And all of a sudden, I had to have them talk to each other, and I realized it was a mess because because no one knew how to do that. So I had to establish a protocol, explain a few things, and uh, and um, things went well. But yes, once you start having multiple parties, yeah. then it gets exponentially complicated. I think a really a really basic one that always surprised me is how you can take um, you you have to learn to remove all uh, slang pop culture references and colloquialisms out of your lingo and you don't realize how often you're doing it i think when you and i talk or people and let's call it us or uk us culture european culture whatever and then you actually start realizing it's like it's like you know being a stand-up comic and 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 telling jokes that no one understands and then awkward crickets afterwards and so you <laughs> so you're like so you keep making references like you know like it's like a Game of Thrones reference or something, and everyone's like, "Yeah, <laughs> I guess you got nothing." Exactly. You know? <laughs> jokes uh, so. is a good one. Jokes are different country to country, so having a repertoire of jokes in a country could be completely yeah. useless elsewhere. Um, another one is um, sarcasm and figures of speech in general. You and I like to use sarcasm a whole lot. No, and, uh, no, no, not no. true. Me. <laughs> But there's nothing wrong with that. As long as you and I understand what's the underlying message, it's just funny. But it's, it can be, especially we use it with a funny uh, connotation. But um, uh, good luck start using that same uh, type of, um, of language with um, a completely different culture that either doesn't use it or uses it in, in only bad situations 
or only to um, uh, to impart a negative message. So you, you can actually communicate exactly the opposite what you're trying to uh, communicate. Um, so yes, I also had to adapt my my communication style, uh, especially when I was in uh, in East Asia, uh, with a much simpler English, simple words, uh, less sophisticated vocabulary. I almost unlearned English at some point. I realized after years of age because I couldn't use sophisticated words because it would just take longer to explain what I was trying to say. And um, and yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. You gotta go through it, but. Uh, but it's also it's also rewarding because once you achieve that goal, once you achieve that, um, and you get a little badge of uh, I have explained the complex uh, engine things. So, <laughs> this is something I, I always remember. My friend was so impressed when he came to visit me in Korea. This is Luca, you know, yeah. and um, and I was our the scooter I had was breaking down, wasn't working properly, so we drove to my mechanic. And in Korea, and I explained to him that the carburetor wasn't working properly, wasn't loading the fuel properly. <laughs> and he was like, how do you know that? You've been here for four months. I'm like, look, I have a dictionary, I picked it up. And you just simple words, put them together. And 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 but having that uh, satisfaction of having um, unlocked the skill of uh, explaining carburetor to mechanic in Korean, oh, there you go, right. self-confidence. <laughs> and it makes up for all the struggle that comes with being a fish out of water yeah. because there is struggle. There's moments where you really feel like um, like carpet, like crap. Uh, we all are vulnerable to a certain extent. And if you don't understand that you're all vulnerable and you have to change when you go to, in a completely different environment, you're going to do it wrong anyway. So you need to really be humble. And uh, and that's one thing that I had not learned in Italy. You know, good at bringing, easy life. Uh, and, uh, I, I had everything I needed. Whereas you put yourself in a situation where everything you, you have doesn't help, and you gotta find something else to get by, and that's where you have to win your vulnerability. You, you many times you are having dinner by yourself, or and you feel lonely. You don't see anyone for a day or two or three in a row. Also in Hong Kong, I had the specific um, setup. I was doing tech startup in Hong Kong before tech startups were a thing. I was the only one. <clears throat> all the expert community in Hong Kong, but even locals were bankers, finance, trading. There's a lot of st stuff going on in Hong Kong, but few were doing tech startups in 2008. Yeah. And so I was a bit of fish out of water. You know, everyone goes to all their super fancy offices of high rise at uh, uh, 7.30 a.m. before the markets open. I'm like, okay, so I go in this shitty serviced office uh, that is with, without a view and uh, I have to type out emails all day long and then no one to see all day long. And it, it, it does kick in. Uh, it's mm. debilitating. It's uh, it's uh, eating you out from inside, and uh, dealing with that is uh, one of the biggest challenges. Take it, it, it beyond the the kind of individual. Let's look. Let's look at um, broad cultural implications for a second. So, mm. uh, you know, there's there's jokes uh, about you know, different. You know, what the Americans are like, and the Brits are like, and the Aussies are like, and you know, all these different kind of stereotypes that are out there. And some of the stereotypes are obviously not appropriate uh, at, at any level, but there are some pretty funny stereotypes I think out there about you know certainly working cultures and so on. And one of the ones that uh, I noticed when I worked in in Amsterdam, which was uh, one of my for, for the record probably my favorite place I've I've lived or worked, and would move back in in a heartbeat. So I want to be clear, lead with saying like I I loved it, but it also um, made me quite reflective of the fact that you know the the Americans uh, with all the quirks we may have about our, our own uh, society and, and so on th there is a uh, like a workaholic kind of reputation that sometimes can go along with with uh, with the US culture and you know I think you know it's, it's not uncommon to hear people talking about working 40 50 60 you know or more hours a week in US culture and I think the Dutch thought we were basically bonkers um, you know, absolutely nuts. And, and, and so, you know, at one point, you know, I think when I was there, you know, they were seeing me emailing them at two in the morning all the time and, and things like that. And I, that's just me working, you know, working for and trying to get stuff done. Um, sometimes I would get frustrated because things didn't move at the speed I wanted to go to. But then at the same time, I would find myself kind of going, uh, 
you know, I, I feel like that that way at the beginning. Then after a couple of months, I started kind of feeling like maybe I'm doing it wrong. Like the all of these people seem so much uh, more seem so much happier <laughs> than I am, and their life seems so much more balanced than 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 maybe how I look at life. And you know, maybe maybe we're doing it wrong. Um, I'd be interested to know if you've kind of experienced or any of these kind of um, cultural differences between a way that maybe the culture that you know and you grew up with or, or the culture you identify with maybe not not aligning with the culture you were in and and may, maybe you still uh, prefer your way or maybe it impacted you back like it did for me, but I'd love to hear about any experience uh, you've had there. Well, my dad used to take a Concorde flight to have a meeting in New York and be back for dinner in Europe. So <laughs> I don't know how that accounts for my education and upbringing. Um, I have to admit that when you start a company and you're in startup mode and you're bootstrapping, I don't think there's a lot of space for nine to five uh, relaxation. Um, that's personal. I mean, maybe the other people will uh, will perform better having a hard stop at five pm. I, I don't uh, I don't judge them. Um, but definitely one thing that made me realize how having a break in the middle of the day worked really well was when I was in Korea, I was working at a major airline there for a, for a good summer and um, lights went off at noon and the whole office would turn dark. People would pull out their pillows, the pillow on the desk and the whole office, like thousands of people would just put face on the desk and sleep there for an hour only <laughs> to wake up at 1 p.m lights on, Whoop! everyone starts typing again on their keyboards. And that was beautiful because, you know, it's a collectivist society uh, there. It, it, things done in synchrony and synchrony with other people are more meaningful. And um, and taking that break and forcing myself to take that break also because me typing alone in the dark was a little awkward, um, made my days a lot better. Um, there's, I, uh, it's, it's always, hard to judge how hard you should push in terms of our um, okay. hours. But the downside of, uh, of measuring work by hours of the day is that then you start having, you introduce inefficiencies. And same country, Korea, well, it, it applies to a lot becomes, of East it Asia. some kind of weird badge of honor, and I don't necessarily think it's a good one. And I, you know what I mean? But I, and, and, and I think that was kind of what, what hit me. Yeah, but it gets worse. So in most of East Asia, when um, there's a very specific protocol about who gets to office first, and usually the, the bigger boss you are, you come in first and you leave late. late. You have to be there for uh, and to be seen at your desk the whole time. So your um, subordinates should come to the office and see you already working there and should leave before you. And so there was all this structure of environmental structure of people coming in and leaving at, uh, at pre prearranged times, and of course, as a proper fish is a water out of water, I couldn't care less, and I would show up and leave at any time. So it fit me most, but I, I received some reprimands for for uh, for not respecting the proper uh, schedule. But that's the thing: people who had to stay longer than when their job was done were were highly demotivated and efficient. Then they had the long commute home. What was the point? And others who may have stayed longer, but had to take the work home because they couldn't be seen staying longer than their boss. Come on, those are things that can be overcome. And I think, I think the reshuffle that happened in the last one year with um, the global pandemic probably helped with setting these things because having the flexibility of uh, getting work done in multi various places and various times um, put a little more uh, responsibility on the individual to manage its own time. This, that's a, this is a great, great debate you just brought up. So you could argue that uh, in the past, like I got to work in Shanghai because I was incredibly fortunate to be working for Sapient and they facilitated me to be able to do that and the travel and providing living facilities for me and everything else. I was extremely lucky. And that made that possible for me. Now you could argue in the that there's, uh, that corporate and relocation and stuff enables this but you mm -hmm. could also argue in a gig centric economy that where there are more digital nomads frankly out there like like uh like me um that 
uh, you know, I can go out there and and go experience more of these cultures on my own volition because I theoretically shouldn't have the boundaries um, of a you know traditional job. So, what's your take? Is is post COVID going to enable more people experiencing other cultures, or do you think actually people might be working remotely, but they're not going to you know kind of move beyond the the barriers of their own house? Uh, unfortunately, the latter. I think that. Work-wise, COVID has been interesting, but we're also exposed to a very narrow niche of tech uh, consulting. Uh, I, I was in the Bay Area for COVID, so obviously, a uh, bubble within the bubble within the bubble. Um, I mean, if you <laughs> look at how... The mega bubble. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you look at how a normal average worker that is not in tech, that is not in a developed country, may have felt to work at, during COVID, it, Totally different. Yeah. Frankly, it's scary. Um, and also, COVID has changed our personal lives and sensitivity towards uh, exposure, travel, uh, shaking hands, meeting people, to the point where I think that it's actually after a little bit of a peak of uh, summer vacation where everyone wants to, to go everywhere, the vast majority of people would prefer to stay put and, and do less, go less outside in an unexplored territory. There, there was actually, I read something on The Economist uh, about uh, um, peaks of um, uh, willingness to discovery, experiment, and uh, um, entrepreneurial activity after major disasters in the past, uh, in the past century or two. Um, I wish that's going to happen. I'm, I'm fearful, though, because um, the scar is big and frankly still open. That's the other problem. So, so, um, so flipping this back, uh, let, I'm going to ask, I think maybe one or two more questions, just being conscious of time. Um, what is, not to put you on spot, is there mm -hmm. any uh, funny, funny, maybe they're embarrassing or they're not embarrassing, but kind of funny moments you can think about where this fish out of water moment kind of made things go, uh, Go well. They could be maybe they're an ocean moment. Maybe they gone horribly wrong. But just funny moments where you know being this fish out of water uh, created some unusual moments in your life. Let's call it. I think you're like which ones can I tell on camera? Exactly. Like, no, so the, the, no, I'm filtering no, here. No, <laughs> no. Maybe this. Uh, one. <laughs> I think I could get away with a lot of stuff. Um, not necessarily bad things, but I could get away with special requests um, better, being the fish out of water. Because think about it, you have a tuna that is walking into your room and says, Freddy, can I have a coffee, please? You probably serve a coffee to the tuna that walks into your room. But if your wife comes to your room while you're working and asks for a cup of coffee, you'll tell her that you're working and you're busy. I'm sorry. And so the, the, I, I probably abuse of that uh, being fish out of water situation <laughs> a lot. Uh, you know, look, asking for a meeting with the CEO of a huge company, and they're like, you, you, oh, you could basically get you could get away with stuff that you just couldn't. couldn't yeah, and they're like, oh, this foreigner maybe has something really interesting to say, <laughs> and I could get this meeting, these impossible meetings, and uh, that's breaking their rules and structure. But you have a good reason and you have a, a good excuse, and as long as you're respectful and uh, and um, have good intentions, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, I give, I give you mine, uh, and I've got one, le one uh, left. I think is, is, is camera friendly. So this one always mm. cracks me up. So when I, when I went to um, uh, Amsterdam to, to work for uh, uh, a leading global baby stroller brand, um, I was, uh, you know, the head chief digital officer. I was responsible for, uh, you know, a, a lot of different parts of our business, including our e-commerce platform and you know, marketing automation and things like that, and Salesforce was a partner stuff. And so, you know, Salesforce always has these big events that they invite you to, and, um, and uh, their, their big rep says, hey, you know, would you like to go uh, to uh, the you know, Amsterdam Gay Pride Festival, you know, with, with Salesforce? And I thought, you know, on our boat, I said, oh yeah, great. So in my mind, uh, you know, boat means yacht, and, you know, because anything of Salesforce, I think of like the Can Lions and the South of France and stuff. And it's like, I'm visualizing us on some kind of boat, you know, kind of like off, because I've been there like 
three weeks, right? Like, like you know, like off the side of the parade, drinking champagne and watching like this parade go. I have no idea that it's like one of the biggest gay pride festivals in the world. I just don't understand why I signed myself up for. I'm like, great, can I bring my wife? Oh, absolutely, so great, wonderful, very excited. They're like, just show up at this dock at this time on this day. Now, my wife started getting, you know, kind of cold feet and and end up sending me on my own. So I, I show up in the taxi to where I'm expecting this yacht to be. And there are a whole bunch of people, like 70 or 80 people, wearing Salesforce t-shirts, doing a, a dance routine, a coordinated dance routine. I kid you not. And I'm like, um, I'm here for the Salesforce uh, you know, boat. They're like, oh, great. You're here. If you're here, Mr. Lake, are you? Um, we're just practicing the dance routine. And I was like, I'm, I'm sorry. They're like, so like, here's your shirt. So if you can get in and learn the move, that would be great. And I was like, uh, I'm sorry. I was completely confused, right? But I'm going with the flow, trying not to be the, the odd guy, right, in this culture. I don't know. And I said, well, what's the dance routine for? They're like, well, you're, you know, you're in the parade. And so when the cameras turn on, you know, because it's a nationally televised parade, you know, there's a couple times during the parade, they're going to turn the cameras on us. And you're going to have to do the dance routine because we really want to win the best dance contest or best your know, best float or dance or whatever it was in, in, in this massive national parade. And also it just hits me. It's like, I'm not watching the parade. I am the parade. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, so I was like, okay, there we go. You know, through, through you my, I, remember was dressed, I was dressed all nice. I had like a collared shirt and stuff. I was dressed in like, Yacht, yacht wear. I was like, yes. I was like, I'm going yachting today to watch the Gay Pride Festival in Amsterdam. It's going to be lovely. And uh, you know, stripped that off, threw that in like a bag I brought with me, and threw uh, threw <laughs> threw the Salesforce T-shirt on, and uh, uh, basically went. And by the way, it wasn't a yacht. It was is literally a barge. It was a barge with like coolers on it. Luckily, they had a decent amount of booze on it. And, uh, and and we just went for it. And I had to be honest, it was the bomb. I mean, we had so, so much fun. Um, but yeah, I, I never dreamt uh, that I would be in the Gay Pride Festival in Amsterdam. But yeah, there we are. I would do it again in a heartbeat. Uh, but it was definitely a moment of cultural misunderstanding gone completely wrong. And my wife hates big parties on a side note. Had I dragged her to that and pushed her on that barge, I would probably have another list of things that she'd never forgive me for, but that would be pretty <laughs> high on the list. <laughs> so that is my my fish out of water uh, uh, moment. So uh, I'm gonna. I, I think it's a great a great place to end today's uh, show. I want to give a special shout out again uh, to Anne, who is the chief compassion officer uh, uh, at. Um, uh, you know, basically, I, she's been a big enabler, very engaged in the show, uh, and I, she's uh, a team of three. I meant to say, I love that. You know, it makes sense that as a chief compassion officer, she'd be engaged in today's episode because I think a lot about being um, effective in a in a foreign culture or working abroad is frankly about having empathy, which um, you know, obviously, is a synonymous with compassion. So, uh, Sergio, I want to thank you uh, for being on the show today. Uh, I, you know, you're always an interesting guy. It's always great fun to hear about your adventures. I'd also like to thank um, you know, those of you who are watching, whether you're watching on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, uh, Periscope, uh, even rebroadcasting on Instagram these days. We thank you very much. And if you're listening via our audio podcast, that's great. The best way, if you always want to find out more about O'Ship, go to oshipshow.com and you can get direct links to all of our social profiles and you can see the latest episodes as well as watching um, our archive of shows. And if you want to support the show, the best thing you can do is tell your friends, uh, share the share the uh, videos, uh, you know, give it a like, anything you do, any kind of support for the content just encourages us to keep producing this this great content uh, week over week and, and bring in awesome guests um, like Sergio. So Sergio, you, Friday. This was have, a good an chat. Aw- yeah, have, an aw- have an awesome day and uh, thanks mm-hmm. for the engaging chat as always. And thanks uh, for watching, have a good weekend. Our next, our next adventure together.